Welcome to week two of our celebration of African American poets. My name is Molly, and each week here at the McKinley Memorial Library, I will be discussing one African American poet and the impact that their works, art, and experiences have had on American literature and culture. I'm excited to celebrate Black History Month by recognizing the accomplishments of these poets who have boldly confronted adversity and inequity throughout American history. This week's featured poet is Jesse Redmond Fawcett. Fawcett was an African-American editor, poet, novelist, and educator in the 20th century. Fawcett facilitated numerous contributions to the Harlem Renaissance, which was an explosion of African-American culture centrally located in New York City during the 1920s. However, Fawcett's own literary works have gone unnoticed and underappreciated in the century since their publication. Fawcett's emphasis on sentimentality and individuality in her poetry necessitate a closer look at her work. Let's get started with Fawcett's biography and some historical context for her poetry. Jessie Redmond Fawcett was born on April 27, 1882 in Camden County, New Jersey, and grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She received a scholarship to study at Cornell University, where she was one of the first African-American female students and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Classical Studies in 1905. After graduation, Fawcett worked as a teacher in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. In 1912, Fawcett began writing for The Crisis, the NAACP's official magazine co-founded and edited by W.E.B. Du Bois. After seven years and numerous poems, essays, and reviews contributed to the crisis, Fawcett became the literary editor in 1919 and moved to New York City for the position. In addition to publishing her work in the crisis, Fawcett also published several novels during the 1920s, including There is Confusion in 1924 and Plum Bum in 1928. Fawcett's novels notably portrayed middle-class African-American life and questioned respectability, sentimentality, and idealism in African-American culture. Many of the portrayals in Fawcett's novels are still applicable to contemporary society. Fawcett left the crisis in 1926 to teach high school French in the Bronx. She married businessman Herbert Harris in 1929, and the couple moved to New Jersey and lived there until Harris's death in 1958. Fawcett returned to Philadelphia and lived there until her death on April 30th, 1961. Pictured here is the portrait of Fawcett that resides in the Smithsonian. Looking over Fawcett's biography, much of her life was lived teaching and directing others towards literary prestige, particularly during the Harlem Renaissance. I want to take a moment to provide you with some historical context and background information on the Harlem Renaissance and the movement's influence on African American culture after World War I. The movement wasn't confined to the Harlem district of New York City. Serving as more of a capital of the artistic and literary movement, the creators and writers that emerged on the scene during the Harlem Renaissance produced works that broke away from stereotypical, often discriminative, white representations of African American heritage and culture. Moreover, writers fought against racist beliefs and disrespect of their lives, effectively laying the groundwork for an African-American collective consciousness and a greater understanding of their cultural heritage and relationships with each other. This uplifting of African-Americans proliferated literacy rates and racial pride. The efforts of the Crisis Literary Magazine were crucial to the movement, and the writers that Fawcett introduced to the literary scene during the Harlem Renaissance have made immeasurable contributions to African American literature and culture, including County Cullen, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, and Anne Spencer. Fawcett's ushering in of creative and artistic expressions from writers during the Harlem Renaissance was an act that she unfortunately did not receive much credit for. As we study African American literature, it is important to also discuss the feminine perspective with racial perspectives within the works of the 20th century. Fawcett hasn't had anyone to champion her work since their publication nearly 100 years ago, and many contemporary authors and critics are not familiar with her work. In an article published by New Yorker magazine in 2017, Morgan Jerkins relates that women writers during the Harlem Renaissance were slighted during the celebration of the literary movement. Literary critics of the time, such as Alan Locke, who Fawcett held in contempt for more than a decade, commented that the feminine perspective during the Harlem Renaissance lacked an adequate amount of social commentary. Moreover, critics also criticized Fawcett's work as sentimental and Victorian, 
Yet this dismissal of Fawcett's work distinctly reflects the patriarchal beliefs held by many people during that time. Scholar David Lerving Lewis relates this as he writes, there's no telling what she would have done had she had been a man. Likewise, Fawcett's focus on gender inequalities mirror perspectives of racial inequality within her work. Within her prose and poetry, Fawcett reflects on the meaning of individuality and identity for African American women within society. Many contentions within her works are relatable to questions modern society poses, and she engaged in issues of race, class, and gender more than she has received credit for. Fawcett questioned whether individuality was reserved only for whites and if African Americans had to reflect on the larger ideals of their community, writing in a 1922 essay that judgment and oppression from the white community resulted in a quote, a stilted art and a lack of frank expression on our part. These contentions on the feminine perspective and racial inequality are illustrated in Fawcett's poem, Oriflamme, which is the French word for a banner, symbol, or ideal inspiring devotion or courage that we will read and explicate next. Published in January of 1920, Fawcett's poem begins with a recollection from Sojourner Truth, who Fawcett regarded as a mentor. First, let's read through Truth's recollection and Fawcett's poem in their entirety. I can remember when I was a little young girl, how my old mammy would sit out of doors in the evenings and look up at the stars and groan, and I would say, Mammy, what makes you groan so? And she would say, I am groaning to think of my poor children. They do not know where I be, and I don't know where they be. I look up at the stars, and they look up at the stars. Sojourner Truth I think I see her sitting bowed in black, stricken and seared with slavery's mortal scars, reft of her children, lonely, anguished, and yet still looking at the stars. Symbolic mother, we thy myriad sons, pounding our stubborn hearts on freedom's bars, clutching our birthright, fight with faces set, still envisioning the stars. Now let's look at an explication of the poem. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to state that the following interpretation is just one interpretation of Fawcett's poem and is in no way a definitive reading. That's the beauty of the subjectivity of poetry. Our experiences, including our race, affect how we interact with and interpret poetry. So what do I mean when I say an explication? An explication is an analysis of a literary work, in this case Fawcett's poem, that gives a detailed explanation of the poem itself. We are going to look at Fawcett's poem from the feminist and new historicist perspectives, meaning we connect Fawcett's poem with the cultural and political movements of her time versus our time. We will see that Fawcett's poem is a reflection on two sentiments, the feminine conscience of enslaved women and the personal and greater cultural ramifications of slavery. Let's look at Fawcett's poem line by line. In the first and second lines, Fawcett pictures this occasion of Truth's mother sitting outside. The word bowed allows us to picture her physical appearance, hunched over both with age and the effects of years of strenuous labor, and with the weight of the oppression that Truth's mother experienced as an enslaved woman. I mentioned in last week's explication that the color black is often synonymous with wickedness and sin, but in Fawcett's poem, the word black refers only to the color of her skin. It is the second line that provides a mental picture of the harsh realities of slavery. The words stricken and seared bring to mind the physical horrors of the punishment that enslaved persons were forced to endure, with the mortal scars inflicting more than bodily harm, as Fawcett emphasizes in the next lines of the poem. Line three reflects on the consciousness of Truth's mother. Historically, Many women who gave birth during enslavement had their children ripped away from them, unable to fight back against the greed and malice of their slave owners, and their children were sold into slavery. Truth's mother experienced the loss of her children at the hands of slavery, and she reflects on the robbery of her familial connections with her children, feeling powerless to have changed the outcome. Yet the fourth line takes on a more optimistic tone. As the mother looks up at the stars in the night sky, we find a beautiful sentimentality in the poem. Despite not knowing where one another are in the world, a mother wonders still about the whereabouts and well-being of her children. 
This reflection on the interior of the mother's mind is a modernist aesthetic in poetry, and in turn, Fawcett takes the mother's anguish and makes it universal to all African Americans, those formerly enslaved and those born free, in the fifth line of the poem. Fawcett reckons Truth's mother as the symbolic mother of all African Americans, and it follows that every African American is one of her children continuing to fight for justice and equality. The last three lines in the poem are raw and powerful. The stubbornness of African Americans in line six speaks to the struggles and triumphs of fighting against racism and the prejudices that threaten to metaphorically bar them from freedom. Moreover, Fawcett asserts that freedom is a birthright for all African Americans, and as a community, they are willing to fight against any threat to their freedom as American citizens. The last line of the poem harkens back to the optimism of the fourth line, as the words, still envisioning the stars, beckon a bright and future for all African Americans. Within her poem, Fawcett brings the historicism of slavery in with the sentimentalism of African Americans at the turn of the century. Understanding that African Americans in the 1920s were affected by a dual consciousness in a society that continued to discriminate against them, Fawcett writes Oriflam as a commemoration of the self-reflections and collective confidence of a community on the brink of equally momentous literary and cultural achievements. Primary works written in the time of the Harlem Renaissance are incredibly insightful when we examine the literary and cultural works of the African American community following the Reconstruction period, but before the Civil Rights Movement. If you are interested in reading other works of African American literature similar to Jesse Redmond Foss's poetry, we recommend Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which at one point was out of print for 30 years following audiences' rejection of the strong African American female protagonist, and is now considered a classic of the Harlem Renaissance and one of Hurston's best known works. Cain by Jean Toomer, a pioneering text of the Harlem Renaissance. Detailing the lives of African Americans living in the Jim Crow rural South, Tuber's work combines poetry, prose, and play-like dialogue in this piece of modern American literature. The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. As one of the most influential works in African American literature, Du Bois' essays on race relations lay the groundwork for the civil rights movement. Bronze, a book of births by Georgia Douglas Johnson focuses on issues of gender and racial justice. Some of the more powerful poems within this collection were featured in issues of the Crisis Magazine. Join us next week, Wednesday, February 17th, as we discuss the work of Gwendolyn Brooks. Brooks was a mid-century African-American poet, novelist, and teacher, and we will be taking a closer look at her contributions to the Chicago Renaissance, another literary movement during the 1940s and 50s. Thank you so much for watching and following along with all the ways that African American poetry deepens our understanding of American history and enriches our culture. You can visit our website and our social media profiles for more information on programming and services that we have available to you. Do you have a question about today's explication? Leave a comment below. Take care, everyone.